question in bounded domain. So please, Daniel. Okay. Oh, yeah. So should I click continue? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind kind invitation by the organizer and the uh, home. Uh, so it is great pleasure to give a talk uh, uh, in, in this. Um, so I'm very happy to give a talk here. So today I want to talk about um, some recent results about the damping of the simple, the kinetic uh, transport equation in a bounded domain. So when you have some specific uh, boundary condition. Um, uh, so first I will give some introduction and uh, state the main theorem. And then uh, if we have uh, some time, I will, I will try to go over some idea of the proof. And if uh, further time is permitted, I, I will, uh, so we, we can see more details, right? So this is, uh, uh, this PD is relatively, well, not relatively, this is very simple one, right? You can see that this is a really uh, free transport equation and your F, which is the solution of your PDE is defined in the phase space T, X and V. So here I want to warn you that the V is a variable, V is not, uh, v is not a, solution of the fluid equation or, or whatever, right? So, so this transport equation is really transport equation. So if you want to, if there is no boundary or, or if there is only initial condition like ftxv at t equals zero is given by f naught, uh, then the solution is given by f naught x minus tv comma v, right? So you just follow along the trajectory and read the initial data, that's a solution, right? So, so this is really uh, pure free transport equation. So now, um, of course, uh, itself has uh, some interesting property like dispersive uh, properties. So today I want to consider uh, in particular when you have, uh, when your uh, the gas or the transport equation is uh, solved inside the domain with a boundary, right? So for instance, uh, in, in particular, uh, in order to remove uh, some complication, let's assume that our domain is uh, convex and assume that the boundary is very smooth. So that the picture below here is kind of a good representation of our consideration. So of course, now if you have a domain here, then uh, like, uh, like the free transport case, so you, you just want to follow back and then if you will hit the initial data first before hitting the boundary, then you can just read the initial data. However, if your T is large enough, then you have to hit the boundary and you have to read the data here. You have to read the data here. So in this sense, uh, you can see that uh, actually we, we need to impose the boundary condition for this kind of particles, which means that you have to impose the condition whenever your V, uh, your V, and your n, so this is the outward normal direction, and n dot v is less than zero, right? So in this case, uh, this is uh, so-called the gamma minus inflow data, inflow boundary. So for this case, you need to give a boundary condition. Um, otherwise, uh, for instance, for this direction, this direction is given by the initial data, right? So the, the message here is uh, you have a phase boundary gamma, and uh, we only need to uh, impose the boundary condition uh, to one of them, which is gamma minus, right? which is gamma minus here. So of course, uh, depends on your gas or depends on your particle and depends on your the boundary. Uh, we have uh, several models to give a boundary condition. And one of, uh, one of important and also physical boundary condition is a so-called the diffuse reflection boundary condition. So here I just uh, quote a, a paragraph from the book by the Herbert Spoon. So for the active device, uh, the boundary condition uh, can be uh, can be modeled by some stochastic condition. Uh, for instance, a familiar example is a thermal boundary, so that the particle hit the wall and it's thermalized instantaneously at the local temperature of the wall and prescribed from the outside and then we emit into the system, right? So this, this is a, one of the very natural boundary condition. Of course, you can think about uh, the other more deterministic boundary condition, like when your particle hit the boundary and it reflects uh, like a billiard ball. 
But in reality, of course, mathematically, in the pure sense, this is very mathematical, right? Very, very ideal case. But in many cases, uh, your surface is not very smooth. And also sometimes it is really hard to, uh, hard to detect which direction your particle will fly after you hit the boundary. So for many reasons, right? Physical reasons or numeric reason or simulation reasons, or, or try to reduce the size of the information, often people prefer to use the diffusive, diffuse, uh, diffusive refraction boundary condition. So this boundary condition can be read uh, in general uh, by this way. So your boundary condition um, inside here is now given by uh, integration. So this integration is nothing, but this is uh, your, uh, your integrate all the flow going outside. Right? So you compute the outgoing flux and then, and then you multiply some function and this function, um, uh, this function can, be, uh, can be more general. Uh, in particular, if you allow your boundary temperature is not constant, you can put uh, the local Maxwellian rather than global Maxwellian. So for the local Maxwellian, uh, you, you, have, uh, you have the water temperature uh, effect inside here. For our case, for simplicity, we assume that the water temperatures are constant. So therefore, uh, here this function is merely uh, just, uh, just a global Maxwellian. Okay? So when you hit the boundary, then this is given by that. And you can see that you can compute the outgoing flux and then the, the particle uh, will be distributed by the global Maxwellian, right? And of course, uh, this global Maxwellian has to satisfy some condition. For instance, for this case, we choose our C mu constant to be square root of two pi. So therefore we can guarantee the null flux condition. So if you, uh, if you, uh, if you guarantee the null flux condition, basically you have a conservation of the mass. You have the conservation of mass. So which means that, um, so which means uh, if your initial data uh, is given by the total mass of your initial data is given by uh, this case, then we assume uh, we can, we, this guarantee, this no flux zero condition uh, guarantee that F TXV has the same mass for all time has the same mass for all time. So for this case, uh, for in this situation, your mass is preserved and you have a transport equation, right? So everything is really, uh, everything is really uh, preserved in this situation. So we are interested in the stability of the fluctuation around, uh, around this equilibrium, right? around this equilibrium. So for that purpose, we define the small f to the fluctuation of this large F around M mu, right? And of course, now you can easily solve, uh, not easily solve, try to get the equation, the problem of this uh, small F in this way. Right? So again, the small F satisfies the same uh, transport equation and your initial data is given by that and your uh, boundary condition is almost identical, right? Actually it is identical. Yeah, I think it is identical, right? So now uh, this is the fluctuation PDE and our large F is uh, original equation, right? So what is our goal in this paper? So in this talk, so the goal is uh, we want to show the decay of exponential moments of the fluctuation in L infinite. Right? So we want to show the decay of momentum in L infinite uh, with some rate and we, we want to claim that this is almost optimal uh, in 3D case. Right? So your X is in domain and domain is the subspace of R3. Uh, we want to show that this decay like almost like one over T to the three uh, when the domain is general convex domain in uh, 3D case, right? So here, let me try to uh, clarify our notation a little bit, notions a little bit. Exponential moment of the fluctuation means uh, you have exponential function times a small f and take integration in v. So this is the function of t and x. So in, in, in this paper, in this talk, uh, we want to discuss the result about the decay 
taking the soup in X. Okay, soup in X, and then you want to say that this converges to zero as T goes to infinity, right? And uh, the optimal decay rate of this problem uh, of the momentum is, is actually one over T to the thir third. Uh, this can be easily uh, seen by uh, such an argument, right? So for instance, if your X is away from the boundary, uh, then the particle with a small velocity always always the problem of this problem uh, of this uh, this question is when your particle is a very slow right almost zero and basically you will stay there you will not hit the boundary so you cannot enjoy the mixing proper mixing effect from the boundary so when your velocity is very very small of course you can assume that because your v is uh, variable right so always we have a, such a particle and if it will not hit the boundary then the decay rate of this part follow one of the free transport without the boundary. Right? So for instance, if you look at, uh, if you check out uh, the part of the momentum when V is very, very small, then after a change of variable, you can easily see that this part uh, decay exactly, one, uh, exactly uh, with this rate. Right? Of course, uh, you cannot expect a better rate uh, than this one, a better rate of this one. So of course here uh, you can uh, you can ask like well if your initial data doesn't have this uh, such a small velocity let's say um, always you have a compact support away from the zero particle then of course uh, you might expect to have a better rate however for our case we have please remember that we have a boundary condition right? so whenever you hit the boundary then basically this boundary condition will pick up the zero boundary, um, zero velocity particle, uh, unless we assume some, uh, some non-physical condition to, to this function. Right? So let's say if, you're, if your mu uh, has a compact support away from the zero velocity, then of course you can expect to have a, a better, uh, uh, faster, faster decay than this, right? But otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, if your, if your, boundary condition doesn't have a compact support around zero, then, uh, then basically <clears throat> uh, this rate is optimal, right? This rate is optimal. Uh, so compared to this uh, boundary value problem, uh, I want to uh, show you some comparison between this boundary value problem and the whole space case, right? For the whole space case, it is very well known that the free transport equation has some dispersive property. Well, it is not very hard to see that because the formula is given uh, explicitly in this way. And then now when you have uh, this explicit formula, what you want to do is when you take uh, L1 in V, uh, then basically you want to do the change of variable V to X minus TV so if you compute the Jacobian, then definitely you have one over t to the third. Right? So this is uh, this is a easy way to see the the damping of the free transport equation in the whole space. Of course, this this should be because in the whole space everything is dispersed. Right? And then now uh, for in in general in LP, uh, you can do the you can easily prove this uh, this result uh, using the same change of variable. And after that, you can, uh, you can apply the, the interpolation. So in general, uh, you have this type of, <clears throat> you have this type of dispersion, you have this type of dispersion. But remember, this is only true in the, uh, in the whole space. And if you're not in whole space, uh, we, don't have, uh, we don't have this property. But nevertheless, uh, this t to the minus three uh, will give us uh, exactly the, the lower bound of decay rate. So for instance, in this argument, again, uh, when your particle is very slow, still we have to follow the decay rate of the free transport in the whole space, right? So there is some relation. However, it is uh, uh, this, uh, this whole space dispersive, dispersive uh, property is a little bit different from, uh, from the dispersion from the boundary condition. Okay. So do you General? have any... Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I actually have a question. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering, could you go a few slides uh, above where the mu appears first? 
mu okay sure mu, mu yeah. this one yeah yeah so the so the mu in the boundary condition is the same as the mu in the in the following slide right where you look at exactly. the yeah. from you so uh could you explain how um does it work because you would think that somehow the particles when they bounce off the boundary the slow ones will take mm -hmm. a long time to tra uh, traverse before they bounce again whereas the fast yes. ones will bounce off and then some of them will become slow ones and some of them will stay fast ones so you exactly. somehow think that there'll be more of the slow ones than the mu that comes from boundary for condition suggests mm -hmm. could you explain why is it not the case uh so you're saying that um so whenever you hit, hit more boundaries right so your question is why uh so can, can you say again uh, your question so, is so so okay <clears throat> so so the mu as in the boundary mm -hmm. condition tells you when particles bounce off the boundary what proportion will be slow what proportion will be fast exactly mm -hmm. yeah. but then when you take the slow ones they stay slow for a while before then they hit again the boundary whereas mm -hmm. the fast ones will do it faster and some of those fast ones will then become slow yes so you would expect at least i would expect <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, somehow the overall uh, overall um, you know proportion of the slow particles will be higher than what the mu in the boundary condition suggests mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's exactly correct but yeah. But uh -huh. also, okay, so then I, maybe I'm just confused because you are saying a fluctuation around m mu and m is just a constant, right? So m is constant here, this one. Yes, yes. So, so this constant, yeah, this constant you can compute it from the conservation of mass. No, I understand. I understand. But so, mm -hmm. so but that means the the pro, what you are saying that the pro, is that the proportion of the slow and fast ones overall in the domain is the same as that proportion when they bounce off the domain and i thought that the sure, other sure. just just oh sort of i see i see, I see. that should suggest that uh, they should be the same yeah so let, let me let me explain in this way so you are uh you are saying that uh so convergence rate for the slow particle and the fast particle shouldn't have the same speed right no i'm even saying okay. that i thought there will be more slow particles in inside mm -hmm. the domain than the proportion of slow particles when they bounce off the boundary Oh, but you know this is uh, uh, this is equilibrium, and also we have that issue actually. You know when when we proved uh, when we proved um, uh, the decay uh, the decay damping, and also I th I think it is good I, I think it is good to explain uh, to show you the theorem. Actually, we are not okay. saying that the the large f is converging to mu. Of course, it is not true because just just as you said, to think about the velocity which is zero just you're staying there right mm -hmm. so there is no convergence for v equals zero it is just staying there right so you just read the initial data so here what we prove is the stability of the momentum which means you have to take integration in v right so as you said oh, okay. in l infinite says for f uh, there is no convergence right however here what we are saying is uh after you take the v integration right after okay, you take yeah, the I, integration, I'm sorry then there is Yes. No, no, yeah, that's that's actually the great question okay. because you know, yeah, of course there is a boundary and that there is a boundary which which give us some dispersion or dissipation, but still, uh, for very small, very slow particle, it is just a Hamiltonian. I, I mean, this is deterministic system, so you don't expect to have a decay for that particle. Of course, it is true. But here, what I am saying is, if you take integration in v, or if you exclude that small particle, small velocity particle, then still we have some some uh, some mixing, and this mixing really come from uh, comes from the boundary. So if you're not hitting the boundary, there is no mixing at all, right? So exactly, you're correct. So okay, this is actually you. a very important point because um, here I am saying that this is uh, Hello, yeah. So I, maybe the sorry. Yeah. No. Sorry, can I just ask one question along the line, mm -hmm. one or two? Basically, but I mean, like, it's clear that also your weight e to the theta v square puts a lot mm -hmm. of more weight for v large, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, uh, do you need exactly that weight or any, you know, let's say polynomial weight? Does it uh, I think, yeah, we can relax it with a uh, with, uh, higher, higher polynomial rate, like a v to the fifth would be good enough. I see. Yeah. So you really putting more weight on, you know, V lash, right? You know, the small V mm -hmm. sort of. Sure, and, sure, and, sure. Yeah. And and just just one 
uh, other question is that can you i mean taking the supremum in x is is harder or easier than taking some average norms uh, average in x you mean yeah some kind of oh uh, yeah it's so average in x is uh, easier um easier. Okay. so actually for for l1 we expect a better uh, decay rate mm -hmm. uh, and this l infinite decay is somehow yeah so that there is a certain reason why uh we are interested in this l infinite norm uh, for the momentum yeah but i, I will explain that <laughs> later thank you yeah yeah thank you so yeah uh, as it is uh, as the, um, uh, andrea says uh, it is a stability of the momentum and it, it is not the stability of the transport solution itself right so this is very important uh, this is very important uh, important point of this uh, theorem so let, let me uh, state the theorem uh, in, a, in, a, in a little bit formal way. Uh, so let's say my domain is a smooth and convex, and assuming that your initial data has a strong, uh, strong exponential decay, right? So everything is L infinite, and also you have a very uh, strong de decay in V. So as Hong uh, asked, actually, I believe that we can relax it a little bit. Um, and also we assume some conditions of F0. Of course, this condition is not very um, physical, but we need to give us some condition for F0. And then there exists the unique solution. And moreover, it satisfies the L infinite control. So this part is not, um, so there is no decay, right? So this is just, just L infinite control. And then, uh, and then this is the main theorem. Okay, so main estimate says, if you take um, e to the theta v square and then take integration in v, then you have a decay like almost one over t to the three, right? And of course, this f is a fluctuation, so that uh, the mass, the neat mass of this fluctuation is a zero. Right? So overall, uh, if you write down your f to be in this way, uh, then this fluctuation will converge to zero. And um, in the end, uh, you expect f to be close to uh, this m times mu. Of course, in the sense of exponential momentum, right? exponential momentum. So here, um, so I, I want to uh, compare this work with uh, some previous result. So maybe, yeah, maybe it is a good idea to compare uh, this result with uh, with the so-called the Landau damping, right? So Landau damping um, is again. So this is uh, Landau damping is uh, the property of the solution of the Vlasov-Poisson equation. Of course, like a transport equation, this is deterministic system. So therefore, you don't expect any uh, asymptotic stability of the solution itself, right? However, what you can expect is uh, your electro uh, electrostatic field if it is given by the Poisson equation in this way, right? Then you can see that in the right hand side, uh, this is momentum, right? So this is uh, exponential moment. And the, the solution of uh, this Poisson equation uh, is, uh, will give you the electrostatic potential. And the Landau damping is a sort of the, the phenomena that actually this, uh, the gradient of phi, right? Gradient of phi, which is the electronic field, is decaying as t goes to infinity, right? So of course, for the, again, like a transport equation, the plus of Poisson equation doesn't have asymptotic stability as a solution itself. However, if you compute the, if you compute the electrostatic field or potential, this is basically given by the moment of F, then for this case, uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we can absorb some damping uh, for some special case. Okay, so this is the famous Landau damping. And in that sense, uh, our result has some uh, relation with uh, this Landau damping equation, Landau damping question, right? Of course, recently we can see a lot of, uh, a lot of great work of the Landau damping. And most of case uh, are talking about the Landau damping of quite regular solution of the plus of Poisson, right? It's almost like a, a real analytic uh, or Jeffrey space. 
And uh, so, so this is kind of related work. And also this uh, is related to the Andre's question about the stability. So we are talking about the stability of this guy, not as F itself, not the F itself. Um, Chanu, can, yes. can I ask, uh, so sure. how important in this works that the uh, domain is convex? Uh, domain, yeah, it is, uh, yeah, it is quite, uh, how can I say, of course I expect, right? So people, people will uh, believe that uh, we have, uh, we do have uh, the same decay rate as long as the domain is compact. Right. But in our proof, actually, there are many places we are using uh, we are using the, the convexity, and okay. also uh, so so one of our motivation to study this uh, this result is because basically uh, we want to prove uh, somehow some sort of the Landau damping in a bounded domain. Of course, in this case, because it is a transport equation uh, in a bounded domain, we don't expect a very high regularity. And in particular, if your domain is not convex, uh, then uh, actually we have a severe restriction of the regularity. Mm -hmm. So if you have a very severe regularity uh, issue, then, um, then actually um, I think um, without the convexity, it would be extremely hard to prove some decay or even, uh, mm -hmm. even the well-posedness of this plus of Poisson equation. So motivated by uh, such plus uh, Poisson equation, more nonlinear problem, actually for us, right? We are, we are okay to to impose the convexity condition, but if you if 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 we are interested in the just purely deep uh, transport equation, I think it is uh, still it is possible, or at least I believe that we have a same result for the convex, uh, con compact and non-convex domain. Okay, thank you. So this is, um, yeah, this is uh, somehow, yeah, of course, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hide my intention to try to study this one using our machinery, but I do not want to over, overstate that uh, we, we can solve it. Right? So this, is, this is not a problem, which is much harder, but we, we do have some understanding about, about this very simple uh, linear equation, right? Without uh, any potential or whatever, right? Everything is very simple. Um, so just so let me let me briefly uh, uh, show you some previous result related to this question uh, in particular. So you have a pure transport equation in a bounded domain. So of course there are a lot of uh, some belief in the community in the kinetic community that uh, we do have a decay yeah because of mixing, but um, as as we can see. Uh, there is a lot of issue for the small velocity and large velocity, etc. Right? So, so if you just assume that your transport equation has a mono speed, let's say your speed equals one, which is again very physical situation. For instance, in the neutron transport equation, your velocity is fixed to be one. Right. So your speed is fixed to be one. So for that case, of course, we do expect to have an exponential decay. But now, uh, in this business, your velocity could have a zero of a speed which makes the analysis a little bit hard. And, uh, and the, maybe the first uh, quantitative result about the decay rate is given by Shishen Yu uh, in uh, 99, uh, 2009 uh, for the 1D slab situation. So this is interval. And uh, for, for the Shishen, he's using the prob probabilistic approach of the Markov chain of the IID random variable. Of course, since you're, it is transport equation without any field and you have a slab geometry, right? So you, you might, uh, you might ex imagine that uh, you can change this problem to the Markov chain of the IID random variable. So in this case, uh, he is uh, developing a, uh, the central limit theory of uh, this, uh, this uh, random process and he can give a decay rate. Of course, it is not the optimal one, but I believe that this is the first result in a quantitative study of the decay, right? And after this work, uh, there was uh, people by Kuo, Taiping Liu, and Chai who, who tried to extend and also optimize the decay rate for the multi-decays, right? for the multi-decays, right? So this is one D slab, this is multi-decays with a ball, 
right? For, for this one and for this one, the symmetric condition of the domain is very, very important. Otherwise, as you can imagine, uh, then the random variable wouldn't be IID, right? So if you assume your domain is a, has a symmetric in such case, then actually this probabilistic approach is working very well. And for the second work, uh, for the later work, they can prove the optimal decay rate to the, uh, of the t to the minus d for any dimension, right? for any dimension. Um, so yeah, th this work is great in a sense that you have a sharp and you have a you have an optimal decay rate, and also the approach is very direct. I mean, this is more intuitive, let's say, because now you can uh, you can view this transport equation as a random random process, and you, you can really use a lot of the coupling method of the probabilistic approach, and you have this. However. Um, uh, for my motivation, right? So as I said, this is my motivation. This is a big goal, but uh, driven by this motivation, uh, if you try to extend this machine to the plus of Poisson or more, uh, let's say general domain, uh, there is a big problem as you can imagine because they are, uh, they are using this Markov chain of IID random variable. Uh, it is not very easy to extend their argument. There are many reasons why uh, it is it is not easy, right? Of course, I'm not saying that it is impossible, but at, at least for me, this, this seems quite hard, right? So that's uh, one reason why we uh, why we uh, try to do the try to study this uh, decay rate in a little bit different way, and also the uh, another uh, the recent more recent uh, study is uh, about the L1 decay, right? So this is decay of F in L1. Uh, so this case, uh, there are uh, some some result by uh, Aoki and Francois Wools. So they uh, they again used some probabilistic approach. So here uh, again they need uh, they need domain to be uh, domain domain to be full. So they need some symmetry of the symmetricity of the domain, and they can prove uh, some decay rate. And more recently, the paper by uh, these two group, uh, they, they, they can also prove the L1 decay. Uh, this one is not optimal, and this one is almost optimal decay rate, right? Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is about um, decay rate of transport equation for the symmetric domain, and uh, this one is for the non-symmetric domain, and this is also symmetric domain, L1 decay, and uh, here this is L infinite decay of the, um, any any moments. Right? So as I said before, uh, this has some relation with a plus of Poisson, uh, the, the Landau damping of the uh, plus of Poisson equation. Of course, even we have uh, some result uh, like this, uh, it doesn't automatically say that we have we can prove the damping, a Landau damping of the plus of Poisson equation. Because there are many reasons, uh, there are many uh, there are many steps we have to we have to overcome, right? So one uh, one comparison uh, one comparison to this Blasov Poisson equation might be Blasov Poisson Boltzmann equation uh, with the same boundary condition. For this case, the Boltzmann equation is a dissip a dissipative system, right? It, it is dissipative system. So when the equation itself uh, the PD itself, then there is a, it is dissipative, right? So, so actually you expect to have an exponential decay of F and then uh, compared to the plus of Poisson equation, actually it, we, we might expect to have a stronger decay, a stronger decay. For instance, in my previous work with uh, Kao and Dong Hyun Lee, uh, we can prove uh, decay, exponential decay of plus of Poisson Boltzmann equation so for this case, again, the one of the key is the damping of this uh, potential in C2, right? So we need a quite, um, quite, we need a, we need to gain in a quite a strong, uh, strong norm. Uh, but actually, nevertheless, we have to deal with uh, quite a similar, uh, similar estimate. We have to prove that the phi has a decay in C2 next. And the way to prove it is, uh, so we have to interpolate the decay of F in L infinite, which is expected because the Boltzmann equation is dissipative system, although it is degenerated. 
Um, but of course, uh, this is not good enough to say that the fine is decay in C2 because it is exactly the borderline case of the Schauder estimate. So therefore, we have to do some regularity estimate of the gradient of F or some Helder estimate, right? So suggested by uh, this plus of boson boltzmann uh, result, uh, I think uh, what we have to do is uh, something similar, right? Uh, so currently, we can prove that L infinite decay of the, of the exponent moment, right hand side. And later, what we have to do is a, a regularity estimate uh, of F in the Helder space or the gradient of F. And then we need to uh, interpolate those two, right? And hopefully, uh, this whole program uh, can give us uh, some proof of the Landau damping, uh, Landau type, Landau damp, Landau type damping of the plus or Poisson equation uh, in a bounded domain, in a bounded domain. So that would be our uh, final goal. Uh, I want to mention that um, this result uh, is about um, the, the, the Landau damping of the plus of Poisson equation in a, in a periodic domain. Uh, so, so there is no boundary. And, and, and also we know that there is a counter example of the Landau damping uh, when, you have, when your solution uh, doesn't have a high regularity, right? So somehow, uh, showing the Landau damping in a bounded domain has, a, has a several issues. Uh, the first is the regularity issue, and the second is actually uh, the, the same, same, same proof of the Landau damping in a, in a, without the boundary cannot, uh, cannot uh, easily extend it to the boundary domain case. Any question? Do, do you have any question about the result in the main theorem? Okay. Okay, so let me, okay, so we have, yeah, we have a few more minutes. So hopefully uh, I can give some idea about the proof. So very broadly speaking, the proof is based on the method combination, combination of the both Lagrangian approach and Eulerian approach, right? So I can stop here, right? <laughs> it's done. So basically we are using the, the trajectory and also we are using the energy, uh, energy estimate at the same time, right? energy estimate at the same time. So one of the, one of the key, uh, one of the key, uh, key tool to, to study the property, the nice property of the transport equation is basically we can, we can follow the trajectory, right? Once you follow the trajectory, then you have, a, you have the explicit form. So following the trajectory is not, is very intuitive, right? So you, you follow it, you just follow it and you hit the boundary. And because your boundary condition is given by this, right? So when you hit the boundary, then data is given by uh, the right-hand side and the right-hand side uh, is integration form, right? So basically this is stochastic, right? So you, you just choose another particle in V1, which is a random variable and you follow again, right? So you can continue this process uh, forever. So this is the way to define the stochastic cycle. So T1, this is T1, X1, V1. And then the next one is T, T2, X2, V2. And the third one is T, T3, X3, V3. So you can continue this process uh, to the end. So if you do that, uh, then basically you have a very nice uh, representation of your solution along the stochastic cycle. Let's say this is stochastic cycle. So you follow back and you hit it. Well, let's say if your T is not long enough, then you will hit the initial data. You just read the initial data, stop there, right? And in the second bounce, you, you, you trace back and you, you, you cannot hit the boundary. You just stop there and this is your initial data. Otherwise you will keep hit the boundary, right? So you will keep the boundary and then in the end, you have a bunch of integration of the probability measure, which is given by this. And you can see that this, this is probability measure because we choose our C mu to guarantee the null flux condition. So null flux condition says mathematically, we have a probability measure for every uh, stochastic cycle. Right? So this is nothing, but you just trace back many, many times, right? Many, many times. So this is uh, one of the key, uh, key of our proof. So basically we try to prove the L1 decay and then we try to bootstrap it to have the L infinite decay of the exponential, right? 
So this will be, uh, this will be our first uh, result to have, uh, to have a decay estimate. Right? So first we try to get the L1 decay and later we try to bootstrap it. So how can we prove that L1 decay? So this, the key of this is uh, we, we prove the lower, lower bound with uh, so-called unreachable defect. And this seems, uh, this looks like a doublings condition in the ergodic theory. So basically we try to uh, prove this estimate, right? So if you, if, you, if you ignore the last line, right? So if it is this, so this is uh, general, uh, this, is, uh, gen uh, this is usual, a uh, doubling condition, basically it says that you have a lower bound by the L1 norm. So therefore, uh, if, you're, if you have a transport equation, you might expect to have an exponential decay. Right? So this is the usual doubling condition. What we have uh, is instead we have some defect here. Right? We have some defect here. So when your T is very large, right? if your T naught is large, and if you trace back to, uh, to this T1 time, right? your time interval is T naught, your time interval is T naught. If you wait a bit, then basically you can have the lower bound. You have a pointwise lower bound by the L1 norm of the solution itself. But unfortunately, since always you cannot ignore the zero particle, right? As the Andreas says, when V is a zero, right? There's nothing happen, right? You just stay there. So we shouldn't expect any nice property, right? So we always have to exclude the case that your V is zero or, or V is very, very small. So in this sense, uh, the right-hand side, this defect is exactly that part. So if you cannot hit the boundary, there is no mixing, right? So it's just, uh, just a transport equation. There is, no, uh, there is no mixing. So therefore, we should have this term when we allow V to be zero, right? So this doubling uh, condition is the one of the key to prove this uh, L1 decay in, the, in, in here, right? So how can we prove it? So basically the key idea is, um, so we use the stochastic cycle, right? So, uh, the formula of the, the equation along the trajectory. And also, uh, as I said, this, uh, this defect comes from the zero particle, the zero velocity particle. Right? So we don't expect any mixing of this type if the trajectory cannot reach the boundary, right? So therefore, we have to carefully, we have to carefully uh, study the small velocity particle, and this exactly forms the un unreachable defect, right? So, so we can we can prove it by uh, using the using the Lagrangian approach. And uh, when you hit the boundary always uh, you want to use this transport, uh, this change of variable. Right? So when, so this V is, is exactly the V in the boundary. And so you want to do the change of variable to V to TB and XB, right? So in this way, this mapping is, uh, is bijective and it has, a, it has a change of variable, variable formula like that. And through this change of variable, always you can change the velocity mixing to space mixing along the trajectory, right? So, for, so using this idea, using this idea, uh, we can prove uh, this doubling, uh, doubling like condition, right? Doubling condition. So once you have this condition, right? So let's say once you have this condition, right? once you have this condition, this condition looks very strong because now you have the lower bound, right? L infinite lower bound by L1, right? L infinite lower bound by L1. So if you just follow <clears throat> the usual uh, usual way to to apply this doubling condition in the in the probability uh, in the probability study, you can uh, you have you have this estimate. Right now you have uh, L1 decay, L1 control of this way. So L1 norm of F in NT naught is bounded by, so you have some decay factor here, right? So you're getting small in L L1. Of course, because of this uh, defect, uh, so it is not free, you have uh, something, uh, some extra term in the right-hand side, right? some extra term in the right-hand side. So really the key is, 
how can we uh, build some energy based on L1 norm? Right? So L1 norm should be our uh, majority of our final energy, but somehow you want to deal with this part. Right? So whenever you have this doubling condition, you have extra term comes from uh, comes from is a zero on the very slow particles. Okay. So in order to handle this, basically we, we want to uh, we want to build up or we want to uh, we want to make some energy to make sure that uh, uh, everything is decay. Right. So the main part of our energy should be L1 norm, and this energy uh, should supplement it by something can control this part. Right. So how can we do that? Uh, so basically, we will try to find out the weight function. Right? We will try to find out the weight function psi controlling uh, this defect, right? This defect, and then um, and then we will and then this part, right? So 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 this part we want to control this one in the dissipation of our weighted energy estimate, right? So let's try to get some energy estimate of this phi here and assume that we can, we can find out the nice phi so that the derivative of phi is given by psi, right? So this one combined with this will give us some energy estimate. And the very nice property of this, uh, this TF is actually um, the V dot nabla TF is, give, is negative one, right? So therefore this means what? This means if you assume that psi is increasing function, this has a sign, this has a sign. Moreover, this has a sign, right? So you might imagine that if you do the energy estimate of this guy, right, you multiply this function and do the integration make parts, then we should have some dissipation, right? Because it has a, it has a good sign and this is negative one, right? So using this fact, right, using this fact, uh, if this is true, right? If it, this is true, then we should expect uh, this kind of uh, energy estimate, weighted energy estimate. And what we want to do is exactly using this dissipation to control the defect in here. Okay? So we want to use this dissipation to control the this defect. And finally, we want to combine this one and this one. And in the total energy, we want to have something decay, right? something decay. So that's uh, that's one uh, that's a uh, that's basically idea uh, in this proof of the proposition. Right? And you know, uh, I, I only have a ten minutes, so let me, let me quickly uh, go over the proof. So basically, here we have uh, we need to develop some some family of the test function. Uh, these are all. Uh, this looks a little bit complicated, but these are all natural. If you if you try to solve this problem, and with this uh, family of the test function, uh, in the end, what you can find is you have a this doubling condition, and with this weight function, right, with this weight function, of course there is some restriction, as I describe in here. There is some restriction because of the boundary condition. However, I'm sorry, I'm moving back and forth. So we have, basically we can get these two estimates, right? So we have a doubling condition and we have a weighted energy estimate. So one comes from the trajectory, Lagrangian approach, and the other comes from the Eulerian approach. So now, as I said, the key is try to estimate, try to, try to control this using, using um, dissipation from the weighted energy estimate. Right. So, so once you have these two, uh, then uh, to, to compare these two, uh, let's try to divide it out. Right? Let's try to divide it out. Then, uh, then if you choose your T not large enough, if you combine together, then actually you get uh, this boundedness of energy. Right? So you have this estimate. Well, the way to see this uh, is not extremely hard because uh, with, some, with some conservation law, you can see that this quantity is, uh, is, a, it is a decreasing quantity, right? So therefore, uh, this one is a, sorry, this one is a, like a T naught, F1, TF, 
1 x of v at m minus 1 p naught, right? And then you multiply these numbers and then use the property that the phi is uh, increasing function, then exactly this quantity can control this, right? Exactly this quantity can control it, right? So those are in the same size. So now, of course, it couldn't be free, right? It couldn't be free. If you, if you combine these two together, then you have to pay the price and the pay the price, uh, the, the price we have to pay is exactly this term, right? So you have another extra term, but luckily you can see that if you multiply this one over T naught factor here with an increasing function like that, then again, this term, right? This is something, this is some addition. However, you believe that if your T naught is large enough, if your T naught is large enough, then always this uh, small uh, delta M T naught can absorb it, right? So you, you multiply a small number, make sure that those two are compatible and you increase your T naught large enough to make sure that this uh, extra term is a smaller than this, right? So after you do this process, then you have uh, something quite desirable. So this, this looks almost, almost okay, except the fact that, well, now you can see that there is a, some smallness here, right? So it's less than one. This is less than one. Nice, but still uh, there is, it is not complete. You have a something, uh, something preserving, right? You have something preserving. So now for this, so now for this term, what you want to use is, now we want to use the, the, the full power of this energy estimate, right? Remember that we have an energy estimate, family of energy estimate for I equals one to I equals four. So now we know that at least all those energies are bounded. So the, 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 so the, the idea to have a decay is now we try to use uh, the interpolation between these, uh, these uh, energies. And if you use, the, if you use the, the family of interpolation of the family of energy, then basically what you can prove is this energy norm of I equals one is bounded, uh, I equals four is bounded, sorry. But using the interpolation, you can prove that uh, I equals one is decay, right? So here, basically this comes from the interpolation of phi of our weight function. And, and after you choose your M depends on T quite carefully, uh, you can prove the decay of the energy norm of the, the first energy norm, right? And this will give you, and then basically after that you, you do the, it, iteration and optimize, right? So this is kind of um, a usual trick you do, and then uh, you end up with, uh, you end up with uh, this L1 decay, right? you end up with this L1 decay. Uh, then again, once you have L1 decay, you will use the stochastic cycle, Lagrangian approach. And uh, again, here we use the mixing property of your boundary, right? So whenever you hit the boundary, always we have a nice uh, mixing effect. So you always, you can do the change of variable, right? So whenever you hit the boundary, you can do the change of variable to convert uh, your information to the L1 norm. On the other hand, if you remember uh, this expansion, right? So here, so basically you do have this expansion now, right? And then my G is the F time times uh, some, some growing, growing function in T here, right? So in the end, what we want to prove is that this G is bounded so that the F has a decay, right? So of course there are many terms and the one of the term is basically uh, you, have, you have time integration, you have time integration. So in this lemma, what we will do is we use this mixing of the boundary velocity to do the change of variable and change this to the L1, right? So nicely enough, uh, this one uh, can be controlled by the L1 estimate so that we can use the previous uh, proposition about the L1 decay. For the last term, right, for the last term, so basically it says that uh, we want to measure, uh, we want to measure the par particles, uh, which is still not hitting the zero, right? So TK is still positive, but let's say your K is very large it means that uh, you are still not hitting the initial data. Right? You're still not hitting the initial data. So of course, 
you might imagine that such a measure should be very small if your k is large, right? Because if you're, uh, that means what? That means all the particle has a very small velocity. Otherwise, uh, you should hit the initial data. Right? You should hit the initial data before you hit the, before the k times, right? So, so you, you can quantify this using, uh, using some combinatorics argument and Stalin formula. And the fact is, uh, if you choose k to be uh, like a time t, right? If, you, if your k is large enough compared to the size of t, then basically this part can be, uh, can be controlled by the exponential decay, e to the minus t, right? So this part is relatively small, very small. Uh, this, this is decaying very fast, right? So in the end, if you use uh, this, uh, this trick, right? So let's, let's choose our weight function to be t to the fifth with some logarithmic, uh, logarithmic uh, correction. Then basically the right-hand side is now can be controlled. The, the last part is controlled by the exponential decay. So we can ignore it. This is very fast. This part uh, is uh, basically, this is exactly uh, bounded by one, okay? Bounded by one. Because if you choose this one, then the row prime is uh, t to the fourth. And we know that f, f has a decay like one, t to the minus fourth in L, L1, right? So if you use the mixing that lemma in the previous slides, you can change all of this to the L1 norm, right? So this one is bounded by L. Uh, uh, really, this is the size of one, right? And then since we choose our k to be t, right, k to be t. So overall, what you have is you have, uh, you have decay here, right, you have decay here, and then you have, you have this time integration. So you have a t growth, you have t growth, and this one is like a t to the fifth. So in the end, what you can prove is uh, this decay rate here, right, t to the minus three, right. So, I'm sorry, I'm, I think uh, I speed up too much. But anyway, so using combining these two argument, uh, we can prove that actually the explain, explanation moment, exponent moment, exponential moment is uh, this decay is a damping as t to the minus three, almost uh, with uh, some logarithmic, logarithmic growth in the right hand side, right? So it's the end of the proof, thank you. Thank you. So, um, other questions or comments for Chanu? Yeah, uh, anyone? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, please. Oh, sorry. I had a question about uh, Lemma 5. Yeah. Oh, Lemma 5, okay. <laughs> Specific question. Sorry. <laughs> Um, Good. Yeah. So, right. So we choose these weights, and um, I'm, I was just a bit confused. W would you be able to explain uh, why this condition v dot nabla tf equals negative one is is enforced? Oh, this one is v dot this one, right? Right. So, so why you have it? Right. Well, if you if you draw the picture, it is quite uh, obvious because it's a straight line, right? So it's a deterministic. So so v dot nabla can be understood by this v is what this is d d d s this s v right? V, oh, sorry. So v dot nabla is really d d s. Right, so so v dot nabla the transport operator is re really the OD along the trajectory. So so this means if you're shifting your trajectory a little bit, following the v, right? So you so if this is TV is a this this definition, that means you're approaching to the boundary a little bit more, right? So therefore, okay. if you're taking the DDS, uh, then this is exactly minus one. Okay. Of course, Thank v dot nabla tb would be one. 
Is it clear? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the question. Anyone else that uh, you know have questions for Chen Wu? May I have a question? Yes, please. Um, sure. Uh, Chen Wu, I have a, actually, I, I am an applied man. So I, uh, I wonder about your model and the battery condition. Model, right? You're, yeah. you're saying you're a model, OK. So I see that. Um, your solution leader F is affected by uh, another solution F when the angle is B1. Oh, is yeah, yeah. So you're, yeah. you're talking about the boundary condition, right? Yes. 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 And yes. I wonder why your solution F is only affected on the boundary, but not inside. Um, so it, you see that uh, the solution F corresponding to B1 affect your solution F corresponding to B only on the boundary. Is it correct? Yeah, so yeah, did why not why, why not inside the omega inside the domain omega? Uh, so you, you, you're talking about the boundary condition or you're talking about? I'm talking about, about the model including the differential equation, the transport equation, and so the transport equation, right? Transport equation. Mm -hmm. I see that in the transport yeah. equations. Actually, I this is, I, I do not know when I ask you. Okay? So your, your solution capital F depends on the vector V. Right? Yeah, it depends on Tx V, yes. yes. And on the battery impose that condition that F depends on F corresponds to V1. A lot of V1 actually. And I do not know why the function f corresponding to v1 does not affect f corresponding to v on inside omega. Oh, yeah, because the 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 uh, this uh, quality of the sound is not very good. I'm not sure I understand your question, but you're uh, so you're saying f1, right? Uh, I, I, I yeah. I, I think if you can hear me better than the question was about, you know, like you have the sort of like uh, the, the, the effects on the boundary and why mm -hmm. that effects on the boundary affects the PD inside the domain uh, in sort of like, uh, like why if you have that boundary condition then inside you still have just the pure transport equation. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Oh yeah, that's about the model itself. Yep. Right. So yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. That's a valid question. Um, um, so, so what you're saying is, uh, before you hit the boundary, you cannot feel anything, right? That's your question, basically. You just follow exactly the PD, and when you hit the boundary, now suddenly you you have a very different uh, government uh, okay. model, right? That's is it your question? Actually, we cannot say that before after we hit the boundary because your T goes from zero to infinity. My question is that why the function f xtv1 does not occur in equation 1.1? 1. 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah, um, I only see well, f1 on the boundary only. Uh, so I'm not sure I understand your question, but uh, so so boundary condition for, for this model, right? So I understand uh, your concern. The boundary condition really uh, act when you hit the boundary, right? So let's say if you're not hitting, if you're very close to the boundary, still we, for my, my model, I should follow the transport equation. The, the, the way we have the effect of this transport equation with the boundaries, exactly as you said that, uh, when we calculate x1, v, t1, right? So you use this transport equation and basically this is, uh, because this is characteristic, right? And so this is ODE, right? So, so you compute the characteristic and then you, you can exactly compute when you hit the boundary, where you hit the boundary, right? So when you know where you hit the boundary, when you hit the boundary, you, you just read the data from the boundary, okay? And then depends on the boundary condition, you can stop there. Let's say it's like a Dirichlet boundary condition. Let's say it's a just given function. You just stop there. So the 
but now if your boundary condition is this sort of the stochastic boundary, uh, you, even you stop here, it doesn't give you the explicit form because the right hand side is again given by F itself, right? So for my case, I want to follow it again, uh, again, 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 to make sure that we follow it uh, large enough so that basically all the trajectory uh, with the explicit form is effectively the, is a majority part. And uh, the rest of part, let's say, even if you uh, trace back like a K times, still you might have some leftover, right? Basically all those things are very small uh, speed particles. So we, we claim that that particle has a very small measure. So effectively, effectively we have uh, some explicit form. Uh, so th this is the formula in, in my, uh, in, in this model. So in other way, well, of course, uh, if you're talking about uh, how can we justify this process, right? Because we are working with a weak, weak solution of the transport equation in some sense, right? So if you, if you really want to write down your solution around the trajectory, then you have to justify this mild formula. Of course, we have to do that, um, but, uh, but we, we have done that in the paper, if you believe me. And then we, then we, we, we trace back it several times, right? Of course, it is not extremely trivial saying that your weak solution should have the mild, mild, mild form of the solution. Right? Weak solution is not always mild solution, but for this transport equation, yes, it, the weak solution is mild solution, so we can represent everything uh, along the trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. So thanks, everyone. I think that it's 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 about the right time to stop, and uh, mm -hmm. there was uh, there were a lot of questions and discussions, and that was great. Probably people are happy after. At least with Wisconsin, the semester is over. So I mean, you know, so I mean, Chan was happy. So you know, um, so, so, you know, and then um, we, we resume. Yeah, we resume next week with the talk by Professor Namle Namle from Indiana. So thank you, Chan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the nice talk. <laughs>